Hi guys and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Robbie Cassidy and today we're welcoming on Killian Malone. Uh, Killian is a coach uh, in GA of all levels. He's also a primary school teacher um, and I wanted to bring him on to talk through a couple of different ideas for let's say coaching from even coaching underage as well as coaching inter-county level. What's the difference um, as well as maybe building relationships with teams, managing the game, and maybe looking at a couple of games like the All-Ireland and a few games that had happened throughout the year and a bit of analysis on a few things that could have been done slightly differently. And even we were talking about before we jumped on games that happened years ago that some of you may remember. Um, so we're going to look to cover a lot of things, uh, some from coaching to game management to the difference between, let's say, coaching football and hurling, as well as kids to adults uh, and how all that comes into it. So, Killian, thanks a million for coming on. Uh, sound, Robbie. No bother. Um, happy to be here. Yeah, good. Looking forward to it now. So, I suppose to start off, talking about yourself, um, you're a primary school teacher and you are also working um, with inter-county teams at the same time. Uh, how do the two of them relate, in a way, or do they? Well, just one thing that um, caught my attention there when you were saying it is like the relationships side of thing and that kind of that kind of starts at the early at the early ages in school especially I used to be with the older classes in school in regards to like you know organizing the kind of sporting side of things and the kind of extracurricular stuff and all that but um um over the last um few years I've been with the working with the younger age especially the kindergarten and the junior side of the school and like I suppose one of the top if not the top thing really is um kind of developing that relationship with with children within and outside the classroom and they're like sponges they take everything in even mo- mo- way more than ourselves like and everything is is in the now and the present and um is taken at face value and i suppose developing the relationship with the child is um is is the foundation for them progressing and kind of holding that trust in you and I think that's uh it's something I've been I was talking to a coach actually um with the Clare 17s this year the Celtic Challenge it's something that I talk a lot to about um to Ger Hickey about in regards to um developing that trust with the players because just like it falls into that um relationship side of things so um when 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 you're working with kids I suppose like in regards to taking um, things on board like stuff that you mightn't even think sometimes is like developing a relationship with them could be like even a simple thing that I remember near the last year where I was um, coming into school with my with my overnight oats one of your um, favourite dishes yeah. and um, <laughs> basically um, the kids were kind of wondering what it was and this, that and the other and um, I was telling them when I was um, making it like I was putting in the oats and I was putting in the chia seeds and the cashew nuts and the pumpkin seeds and then um, throwing in nowadays cow's milk, um, coconut milk, almond milk, whatever it is and you shake, shake, shake and you, and you put it in the fridge and the the kids kind of got a, a bit of crack out of all that and um, would really pay attention to those things and then next thing before I knew it within a few days and the weeks that followed like lots of the kids inside in the class could, started coming in and um, and telling me what they had and showing me in their lunchbox and it's just amazing how like just having a bit of crack and making things fun and I suppose kind of game based um, can really can really have an effect on 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 children. And it starts with that that kind of that relationship side of things that you're talking about. Yeah, and I I think it goes to even even managing a team um, is a huge part of it as well. I think there's a certain level of it, and there's actually an, an excellent. Uh, he's a coach from he's a skill acquisition coach from Cork. His name is uh, Doctor Ed Coughlin, and he talks about it as well. Skill development at different levels. Really, really interesting character. Well worth looking up. Uh, he worked at the Mayo Footballers. He may have worked at Dublin as well. I think at the same time are at different times I should say hopefully not at the same time but he um, a lot of the stuff that he talks about is trying to keep it engaging um, keeping it interactive and making it enjoyable so that the stuff that you do let's say whether it's on the pitch uh, at an underage level that it'll be easier for them to apply it as opposed to just having them doing runs running in and out doing hand passing drills stuff like that 
uh, what do you think of that? Have you, when you are dealing with that age, like, how do you th- make things more fun from a I game's s- perspective? Yeah, I suppose kind of having a why you're doing something and having a, a purpose to it, um, really, and how, how how do you make that fun, I suppose, for for the kids, um, in general, just making things, um, kind of, they have such a good imagination and everything, there's, there's and a great way of developing that is true true free play especially with 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 younger kids and say having stations like i know when we work um in school like i could have a station where they're they're working towards building something and uh, they could be out in the sand pit and they're running a shop where let's just say if they're buying a, a shovel or they're buying a fork and the shovels could be three stones the, the the forks could be two the buckets could be one yeah and they're learning a lot of life skills even working in groups um they're 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 doing their maths um and their oral language so like just and then at the at the forefront of all of that is that the that you um as i suppose the teacher that you're developing that relationship for, with them and having that bit of fun and throwing in i suppose your own bit of i suppose creativity i won't say madness like but yeah. adding that in cause like a bit of that spice just makes things that bit more interesting no more than um, when coaching, like you, you want to have um, you want to have things like a little bit different and think maybe outside the box a bit more in in regards to um, how you're delivering something. And it starts with the relationship. After that, then bringing in your own creativity from from what you've learned. And I would have learned a lot through um, listening to um, different podcasts and different coaches, and even just locally. Um, even most recently, working with the Celtic Challenge, Clare Seventeens, learned a lot from Ger Hickey and uh, Donald Maloney. And like when those sort of guys speak, you listen, and you can see that the the foundation for a lot of things that they do starts with um, their relationship, their trust, and the way they speak. Everyone just listens, and there there's um, that sense then of confidence when when um, within a dressing room or or even at the side of a pitch of um, what you're trying to do and achieve and it, it starts starts with that and yeah. I've been lucky enough to have um, worked and um, with and um, worked under different coaches locally even like Dennis Hines there who who would have had a big impact on myself growing up and um, Aidan O'Keefe as well yeah who yeah. are two, um, two coaches, coaches yeah in the North Clare area yeah. how, how do you find uh, the teaching side of things has influenced your coaching um, especially I know it's a different age group but yeah. I suppose the foundation of it it's always the same really when you're trying to develop it yeah I suppose saying what you mean and mean what you say um, is is a big one that when when you have your work done beforehand like when you're when you're planning what you're doing going into the classroom just like when you're planning a session first of all with the with the couple of um, coaches or management you're you're, you're talking about how things have gone and how you want to work on things. It might be a bit of a video analysis and you'll see, right, we need to improve in this area. Or that's working right. Let's let's let, let's see why that's working right. And then something else mightn't be working as well or you could have done it differently. And I suppose put it in the player sometimes and other times you have to be like, right, well, how, how will this improve? And um, try and bring that to the to the coaching p- um trying to bring that to the pitch really yeah yeah and um i suppose it comes back to having that relationship with the players and with the with the management team around you yeah i think you actually mentioned something there that uh maybe a few people might blow over uh, and it's something that i think is huge is that everyone's excellent at looking at what they're doing wrong and why it's going wrong but how often do people look at what's going right and why it is actually mm. working and what's what's helping that uh develop i suppose that's a huge part of it, I think. Mm. Um, and I think in any type of any side of it, I know you you work as a PT as well. You're 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 in every type of a scenario, like you're 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 in every field, I should say. But with that, I think enough people don't look at what they're doing right and why it's going right. Um, and then when things go wrong, let's say if it's a uh, from a coaching perspective with me, they could be increasing their distance every week. Okay, as a runner. Mm. Right, and they're getting better and better and better yeah. at running and then at a certain point things start to flare up and things start to kick out kick in now what we didn't if we didn't look at what was going right before that as well as the fact like you could look at how they were managing their stress you might look at how they were I know you, yeah. you've you been inside view on this but how they manage their stress and, and were they doing their mobility right and how consistent they were with their habits at the time and then as they continue to increase their running and increase their tolerance to it they 
if they weren't consistent with the habits that were before, things will start to break down. So that's my perspective of looking at things that were right and then mm. kind of diving into it a small bit more and, and seeing what's working for them. How do you do that in a, in when you're working, let's say, with the, an inter-county hurling team? From, I suppose, an inter-county thing, from my experience, something that we would have worked on this year is... Um, I suppose nearly every team now is doing it. Um, it's the video analysis side of things, and like, like you said, everyone can pick out things that are are not going right. But like, there are, there's always things that are going right and things that are going wrong. And it's good to um, back players and show them when they do something right as well, so they can they can have that back and maybe they're subconscious and it's something that they could um, dig down and get when it's needed under under pressure or under stress. But um, something like that we would have done this year is like when we were working on a, on a on a short puck out and going through the lines to the delivery zone, just something I have in my head there, where we picked out the clip, goalie, ping, ball out to the wing back, into the midfielder, delivery zone, score. Do you know, and that was something that goes, this is how easy it can be. Yeah. And I know I'm talking through it there as if it was simple, but like sometimes it can be. If the movement is there, the space is there, and um, the the accuracy to the passes there because like I know everyone's on about systems and I know no matter who the coach is or the manager there's going to be a certain degree of offensive and defensive systems but I was only talking to a coach even recently today class and say accuracy can a lot of the times break down those systems with, with pace the both of them if you've class if you've got accuracy and then you do it with the right pace it can um break down teams before they get to do that reset yeah. and get back behind the ball. What and do you mean by class? Like have, having the skills, like like being in the All-Ireland last weekend, I was up in the Hogan stand watching Kerry, watching um, Kerry and Galway. And I suppose I put a big emphasis on watching Shane Waltz, watching Clifford off the ball and watching their movement, especially early on. Like I could see Shane Waltz, it was cutting left, cutting right, something that I... I'm, I'm a big fan of is off the ball movement lateral movement and even like just a little push in the chest and he's he's such a, a good turn of pace and he works laterally so well that it's very hard to defend and especially just off my head now I can't think of it as his first or maybe his second point where I think it was actually his first one where he won the ball came out in front planted his foot over the bar do you know and just um, that's something that I would have um, worked with a lot with teams um especially this year with the with the Celtic Challenge team, trying to get inside movement flowing better. And that movement is created by, like, working as a team. It's not three individuals. If it's three inside, we'll say, we'll just say it is, like, screening. So two can screen one. One, one can screen one, the other guy can get free. Because you want a, a player in your team to get free. It is. It doesn't matter who the individual is, and uh, within reason. And then same as, like, if the ball has been delivered from your, if you're an inside man standing looking out the field and the ball's been delivered for the left, you might run to the left, but plant your left foot and run to the right and get that ball delivered into space. And I suppose trying to coach that movement. And I know in the way I'm talking, it could be like grand talking that or it might be a bit artificial on the training ground. But if it's repeated and the reps are done enough at times, well, then eventually it will come out on the pitch. Um, especially that relationship between the, the person delivering it and the person receiving it, you know. And I'd be a big fan of that off the ball movement, not moving when the ball's in the hand, but moving before so you can get the ball into space. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I think looking back as well, when you're looking at the likes of Limerick and that and the analysis after the games, that was one of the big things that they highlighted was was the movement off the ball and how they were able to make space, I suppose, yeah. separate themselves. Uh, what way are you looking at it then, in terms of like? You're obviously looking at lateral runs. I think screening is something that's a huge part of the game. There's a fine line between a screen, though, and a fella getting absolutely leveled. And uh, you often see it in football, especially in, in, in not as much in inter-county now as you would yeah. in, in the in the club games. But with screening, how are you setting up screens? You, I, I know that's obviously coming from a basketball perspective because that's where it's huge. Yeah. But how are you setting up screens or what way are you looking at screening? So I suppose the screen doesn't have to be too physical. Like you were saying there, you can't just take a man out of it because like if the ref nowadays, especially inter-county level, there's eyes all over the place and cameras on you, especially when you're um, 
um, in the middle of Crow Park. But um, like from just speaking about screen, and I suppose if you have your, your two or three forwards bunched together, no more than the way it's gone in football now with the short kick out, you're trying to just even just cut off the, the forward um, that's um, chasing his man, even just for half a second, stepping across him. You don't have to even put on contact, and that half a second could get you five or ten yards free, and the next thing, bang, goalie goes to him, you're on attack. Do you know? So it's all a lot of the, um, the screening and things like that. It's the timing of the movement, and you're just trying to get that in sync. And I suppose it comes it comes from the training ground that these things don't happen by accident, and players aren't freed up. Like it's it's like just even watching. Limerick a lot this year like it's not an accident I nearly have a name for like giving a ball into full forward line you want that Aaron uh, Galan ball where it's like into space he touches up and he's hurley over the bar he pops it to the third man runner where a lot of the times that could be the likes of Garod Hagerty um, speaking of that third man run it just makes me think of um, I was I was in the Hogan stand kind of in line with him for that goal where that ball was delivered inside and the full forward um Seamus there got a touch that was almost like a centre forward in soccer where he'd head it down and next thing he comes up into the paw bang yeah. goal do you know what I mean that's so, a certain um, level of sharpness there though and that's yeah. Jesus you don't get yeah. that at every level and, and it's split second stuff it really is um, but yeah I think that's a, a huge part of it and I think what you're talking about there is is kind of like the selfless, selfless act as well what players do um, I think that's a huge bit because I think that a lot of the time you can only think about you getting the ball and what you can do on the ball uh, and you're talking about off the ball work is huge as well um, I think that's a really interesting component of it and it's something that you see in teams even when I'm doing physio for different teams you see the managers pushing it a lot more now what type of I suppose when you're looking at the player themselves what type of movement and what type of lines are you looking at of running of, of creating space for um, themselves yeah the minute you talk about m- movement just and it's something I nearly I would have I would have spoken a lot to the boys when I was um coaching um, a local football team there is like I nearly banned the straight line kick and the straight line run whereas like there's always an exception to the rule if the player's way out in front but a lot of the time you're favouring the back if it's hurling or football and it's a straight line pass and a straight line run because the the, the back might only have to get a fist in or a hurl in whatever whatever the sport is so what you really want is that the movement is, is more dynamic it's, it's, it's diagonal so the pass or the run is at an angle and ideally if, if it's both and that's where your cut runs come in and that's where your diagonal ball comes in do you know Yeah. no more than if you look at the last day it just comes to my head as well the first ball in I was speaking to one of my friends and I was like Kerry are going to go direct early in this game and I was just what's happening before the game and then next thing then 10-15 seconds into the game more and bombs one in on Clifford and like as good as Clifford is in the air like that ball is a straight ball down on top of him very hard for anyone to win but next time the next one that comes in if you if you watch it it comes out i think by the hogan stand and it's diagonal ball so like the so there's there's a big difference there in in the ball and in the movement because if if he's under the ball and the kick is is straight in front of you it's very hard to take that down do you know yeah that actually reminds me straight away when when you say that of the diagonal ball of carl Lacey in the all mm. final with um Oh jeez, I can't believe his name has gone from me. Uh, what's his name? There was a full forward for Donegal. Oh, um, Murphy. Murphy, yeah, yeah. W- yeah. Where it's not, it's not a straight line in. It's coming from. The, I think it was Carol Lacey that put it. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong in saying that, but it was such a perfect ball. But I suppose it does come at the angle as opposed to just putting bombing a big ball straight down on top of them. Is that something then that you would promote in training, or how do you promote that in training? Um, yeah, it's it's it's. Um a big one of mine, both of them having the ball at the angle and the movement and, and working on it. And a big one is like the cutbacks. And it's funny you're talking about Donegal there. And I was just thinking of Tyrone when they won the All Ireland when, um, um, what was his name? They came on full forward. I can't remember his name now. Um, 14 for, he's usually around full forward for Tyrone. But um, if you if you think back to the to the All Ireland, I think it was two years ago, where like he runs. He's facing out the field to, um, um, and he runs to his right, and then he cuts his run back inside, and a big diagonal ball comes in, and he fists it to the net, and I. That's basically what I'm talking about, where it's the diagonal pass and it's a cut run. And that's where both of them happened at the same time. Where if he got that ball down the line, he might have been put out over the sideline or nothing might have happened or would have gone 
to the ball just being recycled around the place. So um, it's just something I'd I'd watch with a close eye when I'm looking at um, club or county games and then try to, to add that into a session then myself. And it was something I would have worked with with the, with the Celtic Challenge this year. Like from a coaching side of things, I would have say put down say three cones on the inside line and then the back would have to touch say, the forward would have to touch three cones, the back would have to follow his movement and touch three and then say whistle ball so like I know it might sound a bit prescriptive but it needs to be at first to get the reps in before like it it, it becomes natural in a game do you know like yeah. these things they don't happen by accident they they happen through coaching they happen through habits they happen through reps and just doing that on on um on the training field and then you're hoping then like because like your influence is on the training ground after that you're done it's it's over to the players and they have to take the responsibility and try and um implement things as best they can of 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 their own creativity as well as the movement they've be coached and obviously you're not you're not holding them to to one particular movement but you're trying to build on what they already know and try and progress it no more than going back to in the classroom you're just trying to trying to work what what they have and try and improve on it and see is, is there anything else we can add here do you know yeah yeah no that's that's excellent and i think that that comes back as you were saying to the classroom and to the to the to the coaching side of things of you have to look at the relationship if they have a good relationship with the team and they have a good relationship with the uh with the people behind them and they have a good they buy into the program yeah. that's a huge part of it um and i think that that relationship side of things trying to get them to trying to get people to put it together on the pitch or even even from any coaching perspective trying to get someone to do it in a in a session in a gym session trying to get people to put put in that extra bit of work it comes back to how much they respect you and how much uh oh yeah i suppose how much respect they have for you and and the relationship that you have together from that then i think the next thing i wanted to talk about was the game management side of things and and how we can i suppose I don't know how do you approach that with with players. There's a certain as again, you don't want to be. Well, from my perspective, it's about it's about trying to get over the line and and get the win. So it's not that you're not promoting ta- taking a fella down at the halfway, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely a part of the game now that has to be addressed. What do you talk about when you're looking at game management with players? Um, it's it's funny you mention that because um, I was actually just looking at a at a video recently of a of a guy that um, scored a goal last kick of the game and um, there were two points down the free he was like on the 21 and he went for it and, and stuck it like in the top far corner and say everyone was, was talking about the goal and, and, and the finish and it was it was it was top class stuff probably one in a hundred kind of kind of a thing because of the angle and the situation of the game there must have been 10 or 15 uh, players on the line but basically, when I looked at that, I was thinking to myself, like, how did that originate? Where did it start from? And like, that comes back to my game management uh, point of view. Like, how could that have been stopped? And there's always an origin for for something happening. And sometimes you have to peel back a few layers and try and find it. And um, recently, I was actually only on WhatsApp. Actually, earlier on um, last week, I was talking to um, Ger Hickey, who was manager of the. The, he was manager of the Celtic Challenge, the Clare Seventeens, uh, this year, and um, I went to the went to Crow Park um, to see Limerick and um, and Galway. Sorry, Limerick and <laughs> Lim, Limerick and Kilkenny. Yeah. What am I talking about? Limerick and <laughs> Limerick and Kilkenny. And um, we were watching the game, and he's nearly sick to death of me talking about sidelines because I I've um, I've it's something I've really looked into say in Hurlan where a lot if not most county teams just like sideline the ball away to um, to 50-50 or down on top of the sweeper and and I was um, thinking like it, it's something that has happened happened a lot over the years and um, it happened to ourselves actually in um, in the in the Celtic Challenge um, where we had a great win down in Cork um, in Charleville against Cork where, where we struggled in the first half and really had a great second half and we were a pint up and the ball was in the far 45 in, um, on their side of the field and we, we sidelined the ball away they won the ball went down the field and it was cleared out of our full back line and we won by a pint and like you'll be wondering probably why am I, am I talking about this sideline since we won the game but I was saying on another day that mightn't work out so well so like on the following session um, 
I just I just brought the um, a soccer ball to training and was just talking. I would have done a lot of work in coaching soccer and playing soccer when I was younger. And um, I suppose you might think it's a bit mad bringing a soccer ball into a hurling dressing room. But basically the point of it was, if you're 1-0 up, it's a Champions League final. There's two minutes to, do, to go. What are you going to do with the ball? Like, you're not going to fire the ball into the box or a 50-50 into midfield. You're, you're going to go down the line. You're going to hold possession. You're going to... Going to um, try and play the clock down and that's where your 3v2s come in or your 4v3s and holding on to possession and and go and win it and um, it just brought me back to the hurling when I was in um, uh, in Crow Park in 2013 with uh, Claire and Cork and I was I was only whatsapping uh, Jerry about this recently and I, I sent him uh, a screenshot of the time and there was four was there five seconds left and Pat Kelly was after going over the line and the ball went out for a Cork sideline. And next thing then, um, they sidelined the ball wide rather than holding on to possession and playing the clock down. And um, I suppose Horgan would have been the hero. He would have got his All-Ireland medal and all would have been well in Cork. But um, Clare had different ideas. Pat Kelly puck out down to I think Patrick O'Connor and eventually got to Donald Donovan and then bang over the bar we're going to a replay and the history of Shane O'Donnell everyone knows it with his hat-trick after that but none of that would have occurred I was saying to him only for that line ball you had to keep possession and then it brings me forward to only two weeks ago in Croker when Limerick were in the exact same position two points up sideline on the Hogan stand and I was looking and I was like there's no way they're going to shoot this they're not just going to give a 50-50 they're going to maintain possession and next thing I saw Kyle Hayes going back into the full back line. So I um, so I took out my phone and I just videoed him going back. So it's just coming back. I know I'm going on a bit of a story there, but coming back to the game management side of, of side of things. And I, and I hadn't heard anyone talk about this, that it's it, it, it not only did they seal it once, they sealed it twice. They locked the door, they caught the key and they threw it into the river. And um, they went with the sideline down the line and... Eventually, Kilkenny turned it over, took a sideline game over, Limerick went three in a row. But even if it was, even if Kilkenny won the ball and went down the field, Kyle Hayes was there and no matter what, Kilkenny weren't getting a goal. And just that's just something that really stood out to me after the game. I was like, under that pressure, 74 minute, that they're all tuned in that well to know, right, we need to lock up here. Kyle Hayes goes into the full back line, extra man. The sideline goes down the line like a soccer match into the corner flag, and we do everything we can to see out the game, no matter what. And um, yeah, so that's just I'd I'd be big into that uh, game management yeah. side of things. As you, yeah, as you can <laughs> see, I uh, know that that's that's excellent. I think that's a huge, a great perspective on it and great analysis of it as well, because it's actually something that I didn't think twice about until you had mentioned it to me about the Clare and Cork game. Uh, and how it was a poor sideline that set up the replay and, and set up the win mm. for Clare, which is great from from my perspective. I, <laughs> I was delighted. But um, yeah, simple simple mistakes like that can make a huge difference, uh, especially at the at the important parts of games. And I think it's about being switched on and switched into, or switched on all the time, and kind of knowing your role is a huge part of that. Um, I think then, really, to, to one of the last things I wanted to, to chat to you about uh, and to go into a bit of detail was. We, we talk about movements a lot um, and we talk about the movement of players a huge amount. What then, when you're looking at that and you're planning your training sessions, how do you structure it? So like what's incorporated, what's the goal of each session um, and how do you set it up? I suppose if we're just talking about movement, um, what I was talking about, I think I mentioned it already in regards to having, having the players say, um, having it maybe a bit scripted at first where it's planned out where they might be touching certain cones and having them doing lateral movement to to create the space because like at, on a defensive side of things you want to take away the space but on an o- offensive side of things you want to open it up so the vo- ball can be delivered to the space and look Limerick are obviously the 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 kings of the kings of that um in regards then to a big one I would have found from from going from football to hurling would be naturally in football 
Like even I do it in the warm ups, you kick long, you hand pass short. Your hand pass short is to your third man running. And it's just something well I could I could go to Limerick again on this one that you can see they've worked a lot on, um, where they strike the ball long and then the third man running is coming for a chart. So there's lots of game based stuff you can work on that. Whereas if you had um uh, a game in the middle and you had four diagonal corners and you had a player in it, and let's just say to score you strike it to the player. And then the player that strikes it gets in there, so follows his ball. But while the man in, say, if you can picture this, if it's a if it's a box, say, and the player at the corner receives the ball, well, then you have another player then that's getting the ball from the receiver. So it's just being mindful and really being a step ahead. You're not moving when you see the ball is in your man's hand. You're moving when the ball is in the air before he receives it. And that's where, that's where that, that bit of um, thinking and coaching comes into it that you can't be static and then just come alive that you want to you wanna be kind of almost predicting a step ahead like chess where the ball is going to go and that's what the good teams are at and that's what the, the best teams are doing movement wise that they can, they can see that play yeah. and then obviously it comes back to the execution and the kick the execution and the strike whatever it is is, is there too and are you, ta- are you telling them what the goal of it is? Are you putting them through it, let them figure it out? Are you saying the goal of this is for, let's say, we need to win more breaks or we need to we need to get more diagonal ball into the players? Are you saying that to them? Or you, do you kind of let them play it first and then at, at afterwards talk through how yeah, they get on? It, to be honest, if, if I had to say it straight out, it actually goes between both. Sometimes you'd be like, this is what we're working on. Of course, when you talk to the coaches or if you're planning the session yourself, you have your outcome and you have what you want to want to get from it. But sometimes you can players, it can be like a self-discovery. We're like, why are we doing that, do you think? Or how could that work in a game? And they'll give you the answers back. And then when they do give you the answers back, you know you're on, they're on board and they understand what's going, what's going on. And then you can pick out from... from you can pick out from your own video analysis with the team if you're videoing games, or else you can go to um, you can go to other games where, say, especially a county level where it's happening regularly. Like a county level, like and people might think that all these things are happening, like both positively and negatively, where things are going right and things are going wrong. Like especially when we talked about movement there, like that two v one, where you want to create the overload and get the pass off so you can get the finish in regards to scoring goals, and then the rest of the movement all over the pitch. It is it's really all small side of games and you break it up it's 4v3 it's 5v6 it's 7v5 you know and what you want to do is try and find that man that's free and that comes back to your effort and and your work and just trying to get that man in the ball and I think it's something we touched on earlier like like don't quote me on this one but in regards to say football if you're you might only be on the ball for a minute in the whole game so like if you're on the ball for a minute out of 60, 70 minutes, like what, what are you doing off the ball? So that comes back to your movement, your effort and just thinking like, where should you be now? How can you take space or from a forward side of things, how can you create it? You know, yeah, I was actually just about to say that from a, what, what are you looking at from a back or a forward's point of view? I know from a back's point of view, you said how you're going to take space and it's an else then that you'd be trying to push in there um, as well as the forward's point of view. You're obviously trying to create space. But even as something you mentioned earlier on about screening and, and that side of things as well, anything else that you would think that comes to mind just off the top of your head? Um, I suppose it's to it's to decide what you're doing, and um, sometimes it might be over to the players, and you need to have covered it if it's on the tactics board or if it's on the training ground or even gone through games where it's a it's a it's a big thing. Um, I find in in especially club football there can be a big gap from say your own your the halfway line 65 into the full forward line sometimes it can feel like a mile long motorway as far as them and like how are you going to get the ball up there are you going to run through the hands are you going to have a link man so like it comes back to like what your system is and what you're working with and are you running hard through through the hands or are you trying to get the ball to your kicker to deliver it or kick the score do you know what I mean Yeah. And, and I suppose it comes back to what way you're setting up and um from a coaching or a playing point of view, I suppose it kind of comes back to the culture that was in the county or that's the culture that's in the club. And sometimes you might have to tweak the culture to what you watch um, to the team that you're playing. Yeah. Like, because what you're doing, they might be very good at, at breaking down, say, a blanket defence or they might be very good 1v1. So I suppose to try and give yourself, I suppose, the best chance, especially when it comes to... Championship, there's no, there's no hiding, and you don't have too many chances at it, you know. 
yeah Jesus yeah excellent um, and I think some great points there as well uh, are, are some really interesting analysis of the game um, I think really for now just when you were talking about culture and that that reminds me of, of Joe Schmidt and the way he talks about how he built a culture well tried uh, aim to build a culture let's say in the Irish camp when he was over the Irish rugby team um, and he subsequently brought them to uh, number one in the world and the first time to beat the All Blacks so in fairness he's he's a good man to look at uh, in that situation because he talks a good bit about when you're analyzing the game and you're looking back at the game again what should you how do you kind of manage the players and how do you tell them if they're doing good or bad or or what way to instead of making small changes he was looking at changing the culture of having maybe three values yeah and the three values and i i I know i messed this up earlier it's like honesty is one um effort is the other and i cannot think of the last one but I think it may be resilience or something or, or yeah. accountability or something like that. But the one he pushed massively was effort because you can see if you're analyzing the game, it's very easy to see if somebody's given enough effort because they're yeah. either there, they're either involved or yeah. they're not involved. So that was his biggest thing is like, I can tell you where to be all yeah. the time, but you're playing at such a good level. They're playing at such a high level that it needs to come back to just the effort side of things. Um, and I think that's a massive thing with clubs as well um, or with inter-county teams is, is looking at how you can build a culture around that and build a value structure around it as well um, I don't know if you've anything to say on that or anything that you have to follow up on, on on that but yeah that's just from my perspective over yeah. looking at other coaches I think that's an interesting one and that falls a kind of everything you're saying there falls back into from just the way you're speaking is is it falls back into what are you doing off the ball yeah. do you know because there's only going to be so so much time you're on it so um, it does come back to that from a defensive point of view are you tracking your runners are you are you just running around after the ball are you actually thinking about how can you make a difference um defensively or can you push on up the field and be a plus one and have the balls to go and take a bit of risk especially the way the game's gone now risk is almost coached out of the game like giving giving a diagonal ball in leaving your man um and i think that's something that like we just need to be a bit careful of because the players coming up and it's all like a lot of sweepers and a lot of defensive stuff and it, it can make it very hard on your creative um forward who could be in with two or three in the full forward line and next thing this is seven eight nine ten blanket defense in front of him so um i suppose like anything you need to pick and choose your battles and when you when you see a problem in front of you, you need to try and solve it and most of the time to solve that problem it's it's move it's effort yeah. and um a lot of the time the run and the movement is lateral and it's not just turn it into a sprinting race and run out in a straight line for that that straight ball that we've talked about because when it comes to to championship and everyone's geared up like there's not many backs that let you away with that do you know yeah yeah definitely definitely um, yeah, no, that's excellent, man. I, I'm delighted you came on. Um, and I, just to chat through those couple of things and the analysis side of things of the of the All Ireland, I think was an excellent one uh, because it really brings it to, to light about the stuff that's done right now. Um, and, and kind of, I suppose the game is always changing and it's adapting so much that looking at what they're doing at the top is and, and trying to break it down and breaking down the right what they're doing right as well as what they're doing wrong really gives you a different insight into the game. Um, so thanks a million for for jumping on. I suppose the last thing is then uh, where can people find you if they have any questions when I say that now I realise that you're not the most contactable man yeah. um, I suppose yeah I suppose I'm not especially nowadays I'm not on uh, so- social media but um, I suppose if anyone wants to contact me they can get on to you um, yeah. I suppose yourself in regards to any coaching or or um, personal training or anything like that um, and I suppose I could give a shout out to our, our sauna, sauna Souvenus, yeah. um, that local sauna that we that we run in the North Clare area. If anyone even wanted to um, book in or, or come out to us anytime, um, so we'll be out there, out around in the North Clare region, um, yeah, like that, every weekend. So yeah, that's know? actually a good idea. I didn't I I didn't mention that side that they are running saunas beside the sea, uh, which is a great idea, and they do it in Spanish Point. They do it in. Lahinge and Clahan. Yeah, and Clahan is last one, yeah. yeah. So if anyone's out there, definitely check that out. But uh Sauna 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 But yeah, 
that is everything from me and from us today and um, so yeah uh, thanks a million for listening i really really appreciate it uh, and again thanks again for coming on sounds